Hello there, and welcome to That Pedal Show. Dan here. Mick here. Hello. Okay, another compilation show. We're still in lockdown. Um, Dan and I, at the beginning of 2020, made some New Year's resolutions. Or at least... We talked about some things we were going to try and do in the year ahead. So this video is a look back at whether we did or didn't do those things uh, and hopefully with some pointers as to what we could do better this year. Enjoy. Right, my first one is valve preamps. So at the end of 2019, we'd started messing around with some preamps and got some really great sounds out of it. So I wanted to explore that world a little bit more. primarily for home recording. I had mixed results, to be fair. I think um, I managed to get some decent sounds. So we'll have a look at one. So this is my page going direct into um, my interface, and I'm using the two notes wall of sound for the cab sim. Uh, and I use that for the solo of this track. So that was okay. I think uh, the tone's okay. I think I was more happy with the performance than the tone. Uh, so, you know that you know that works. What changed everything for me was when I got my Grossman isolation cab, um, because I did struggle with the software. There are guys who who can really make that stuff sing. You know, um, Pete Thorne and Rabia are so good uh, with that side of things. I really struggled, um, but when I got my Grossman isolation cab. I could just have amps at home and, and mic the amps up and just use some uh, of the room reverbs and things to add some space around those tones. So I guess the next step for me with preamps is using the effects return of you know the amplifiers that I'm recording with and using the preamps in those different scenarios. Um, but to be f honest, I'm getting so much joy just out of you know using the matchless um, and this hook amp and just using those two to record. Um, but Mick and I have just taken uh, delivery of a new preamp called a Pasta Doble uh, from Kingsley, which is like a two page DSs in series. And they sound amazing. So there's a bit more experimentation for me to be done in this area. <laughs>
Okay, so delay before overdrive. Well, I did persist with this for a little while with the Belly Pop Deluxe there. It's such a cool sound when you put the delay, especially kind of analog and tape style delays before overdrive. Just for a quick recap, uh, let's hear a bit of that now. So of course, classic effect pedal order wisdom says put your delay, uh, all your time-based effects after your overdrives. But there is something about putting that delay or echo, if you prefer to term it that way, uh, before the overdrive, which sounds really cool. Remember, of course, that um, throughout the years, things like echoplexes have been used in front of distorted amps, which is kind of the same as running a, a pedal in front of a distortion pedal. Jimmy Page very famously used it to great effect uh, in Led Zeppelin using his echoplex in front of his marshals, sometimes with the uh, echo turned right off. I think where I've ended up a year later is with some cool learning. Uh, in reality, it's a bit of a faff. Uh, I've been trying to downsize my pedal board, which kind of is a little bit crazy in the context of the um, Mesa 5050 stereo power amp setup that you'll see in coming TPS episodes. But I am trying to make the board just a little bit more manageable in the hope that there will be some gigs again one day. <laughs> um, and in that respect, having that extra delay on there, because I can't do without the delay afterwards for all those other things. Um, but I think what I've learned is where that sound is appropriate. And I think that's the whole point of all of this, isn't it? You try something for a little while and you realize that, yeah, it might not work for every day, um, for every kind of thing you play, but for that specific thing, when you're looking for that sound, it works really well. And in that respect, I think if I was doing anything overtly rock and rolly or, um, you know, very uh, 
uh, sort of, I don't want to say traditional Americana because there probably is no such thing, but what I think of as modern Americana, then yeah, I'd probably have that kind of tape delay or tape delay simulation in there before a light overdrive. It gets a little bit harder with heavier overdrives, but of course then that leads into the whole shoegaze conversation where delays and reverbs before overdrive, as I have come to understand it, are the order of the day. Okay, number two for me was work on my jazz guitar playing. So yes, I really threw myself into this. I um, I studied music, you know, a long time ago, and I've I learned enough harmony and stuff basically to, to keep me going for through um, all of my career to date. And I did study jazz, but I never really was able to play jazz. I understood the basic concepts of jazz. I understood chord harmony and stuff like that, but. Um, yeah, there was, to actually incorporate that stuff into my playing, there's something wasn't quite there. Now, a few years ago, I discovered Pat Martino, and that was a massive deal for me because I I heard something in his playing that it just really spoke to me. It was so, so beautiful. Um, but it was, there was a cerebral thing about it. It just, it, it was so interesting. Um, so, you know, I started getting lessons again and you know, I started really uh, trying to get some stuff under my fingers. Now, the interesting thing with doing the jazz stuff, so my big thing was I wanted to be able to outline altered chords and do minor two, five harmony and that sort of thing. And what I found was the more I got into that side of things, um, a lot of my old playing, when I, went, when I went to go back to playing what I used to do, I found it really hard. And a lot of that old stuff has sort of slipped away. There's a few things that I wanted to retain and that I've had to go back and work on. Um, but because I've been working so hard on this different approach, those two things really didn't mix together. Um, so yes, I've had to be really conscious about, um, you know, making sure that the stuff that I used to do that I enjoyed, I didn't let that just slide. So I did set myself a couple of challenges through the year and you know it's been it's been great fun. Um, the jazz thing for me now, I'm in it and it's going to be a journey I'm on for the rest of my life. Um, but yeah, I certainly did uh, did a lot more work on my jazz guitar playing in 2020 than I've done since I was in uh, music college. Okay, this one has been a massive part of my life, not just about guitar playing, but a part of my whole life. And if you watch the show regularly, it's something that Dan and I touch on every now and again, and it is continuing to work on my mental health. 
The short story is that I think it was during 2018, I finally admitted to myself that I was probably suffering a bit of mild depression. I came to that conclusion because I've been talking to some friends about it, um, about their experience too, but also that, you know, we all have off days. I think that's completely normal and natural. Um, but these were experiences that were going on for a prolonged period of time. And I felt like it wasn't easy just to kind of snap out of it, to use a terrible term, but that's what people say. Um, and I realized it was probably a little bit more than just feeling a bit off. Thankfully, uh, again, um, in the experience of talking to friends, I think it was relatively mild. You know, I have friends who suffer really badly with this. But what I noticed is that I was starting to engage in patterns of behavior that were justifying this state of, of being and this state of mind. And I didn't like that. I didn't like the fact that I was sort of, you know, if I couldn't get something done or... It's, I just felt like I was using it as a bit of a crutch, as a bit of a lean. And then I think the breaking point, or at least the point where I realised I needed to change, was when I realised that I was that I was actually doing that. I was choosing certain patterns of behaviour that were exacerbating the mood. It's been a long journey uh, ever since my mid-twenties when I worked uh, in guitar magazines. It was a very high-pressure environment and I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, I just got into this mode of always being stressed and always being, having too much to do. And I can remember picking up the phone to people going, oh God, I'm so stressed, I can't talk to you. You know, it's those kind of behaviours that um, that I started to notice. I actually even would go as far as to say that I reckon I suffered a bit of something approaching PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, from some specific events that led to what I would call near crisis moments back then, um, uh, in my kind of through my mid 20s and into my mid 30s, I would say. What I then started to notice was that there were specific things that would bring this to a head and trigger it. And certainly being under creative pressure and creative stress, um, even doing something as fun as TPS would would put me in that place and started watching it happen again. This is all pre COVID. So COVID had nothing to do with it. Um, and I distinctly remember I said to Catherine, one day and I said to Dan as well do you know what I'm just not going to do this anymore I don't want to be stressed anymore it's ruining my life I'm not going to be stressed anymore and I started work I'm not sure where it started as such I think I was listening to a program on Radio 4 in the car I can remember the road that I was on when I was listening to um, I was coming up to the Five Ways Junction which is near Box in, uh, in Wiltshire there um, and it was an interview with Alistair Campbell who was Tony Blair's old press secretary, uh, among other things. Pr pretty hard-headed kind of guy. Um, and more interestingly, his wife. And it was a discussion with how depression affects uh, the partner and the other people around you. Um, and his particular depression came uh, as a large part in result of being an alcoholic. And he had an alcohol problem. Um, and there, there's tiny, tiny bits of that I could relate to because I've been asking myself questions about alcohol at the time. Anyway, and I think that might have been the sort of genesis of it. load of other stuff happened. Brain starts getting into gear, starts thinking about these things. And instead of being inside this problem all of a sudden, I'm stood away from it, looking at it from a different perspective. And that's been a key uh, of, of all of this. I then discovered Eckhart Toller's The Power of Now book. That was the turning point. Um, all the books I'm going to mention I have on audio downloads and I started to listen to them in the car on the way to and from work as a sort of study, um, resetter. You know, it wasn't just like one read. I think I've probably done all of the books I'm going to mention, if not 20, then certainly 10 or 15 times each, you know. I was lucky enough during my student days, uh, during my degree, to have psychology philosophy modules it's part of my degree. And I guess I just benefited from that in this kind of uh, some basic ability of abstract thought. And I've always been fascinated by philosophy, um, maybe less so psychology because it's kind of more scientific, but certainly philosophy. But clearly that there is a point where the two um, intermingle when it comes to things like depression. I'd also, uh, through another route been doing some reading around NPD, Narcissistic Personality Disorder. Fascinating. So at this point, I was kind of, 
I think my mind was open enough or I was open enough, even though I didn't have any answers and I still don't have all the answers, but um, because there are no answers, only better questions, right? In TPS uh, tradition. Um, I was open to the possibility that these weren't external forces just acting on me and making me depressed. It might be that my own actions and my own choices and my own decisions were absolutely instrumental in putting me in this position. That was a pretty dark day. <laughs> that realisation that this behaviour that you're willingly engaging in, that you are actually choosing, is the thing that's making you so blooming unhappy. And while it was a dark day on one side, pretty soon after that it becomes this most energising realisation because if you're doing it to yourself, you can stop doing it to yourself. Uh, another book recommendation i should also mention the subtle art of not giving a uh, it has a slightly arresting title which i think has drawn a lot of people to it it is basically the power of now just written in more contemporary language and it was also extremely helpful i've recommended that to a few friends who've read it um <laughs> and I, I you know for what it's worth i think it should be on the blooming curriculum for kids of 15 or 16 years old but the book that stands out equally alongside the power of now if not more is The Courage to be Disliked by Fumitake Koga and Ichiro Kishimi. I think I've got those names correct. Two Japanese dudes in any respect. Um, which is a rereading of something called Adlerian psychology. Now, Ad Adler, Alfred Adler, was a contemporary of Freud, but he disagreed with Freud on something very fundamental. Freud believed in something called determinism i.e. what happens to you in your past life, or sorry, what happens to you in your life determines how your future is going to come out. Adler's view was that is not the case at all. It's not what happens to you. It's not what you're given. It's what you do with it. And it's your responsibility to do something decent with it. Now, I started reading that book because um, The Courage to be Disliked. One surefire trigger to send me into a bit of a down, and this happened... Uh, Catherine will back me up on this. This would happen on a Friday night. Uh, TPS goes live midday on Friday. I start reading the comments and responding. By about 7 or 8pm, I could be in the blackest mood possible because I was responding extremely negatively to some of the hate we were getting, which, when you look at it with a clear mind, makes no sense at all because 99% of the feedback we get on TPS, thank you to you, amazing audience, uh, is completely encouraging, extremely positive and very kind. And anyone who's done any social media um, or anyone who's had something nasty happen on Facebook or, you know, social media is just the pit of pain here, will know how much that one nasty comment stays with you and can absolutely tear you to pieces. There is slight irony there, right? Because what on earth is someone with such a fragile ego doing <laughs> in, uh, in a medium such as social networking? You know, you have no business having a YouTube channel if you're worried about being criticised. Yeah, it's a fair comment. What I think I started to understand was that you know, fair criticism and all of that is one thing. And certainly years in magazines, blimey, we were brutal to one another. You know, the sort of creative criticism in that environment was absolutely brutal and um, as it should be. And we were all most of the time pretty OK with it. But this, you know, on social media, it's something different. Nevertheless, I was intrigued why I was feeling like this. Why did I feel like I need to have to defend this position? Why am I so invested in it? Why is my ego so out of control that it can't take a kick or two? And it really is a, a mental cul-de-sac because there are few things in the world I despise more than this, you know, hey, look at me, self-obsessed world of social media. And yet here I am doing it. So clearly, I had to find a new way to think about it. One of the things I've discovered since that realisation, and this is ongoing work, by the way, you know, it's not, I didn't discover it on Tuesday and was completely fine with it by Wednesday. I discovered it two years ago and I'm kind of inching towards being okay with it. What I discovered through all of this, through feeling terrible and through wondering why I was feeling so terrible, is a bit of deeper learning. And I think, you know, 
if something bad happens in your life or you term it as bad or, you know, some things really are just bad, aren't they? Um, later in life, you can kind of look back on them and, and realise that, that while it was a negative experience and it wasn't a good thing, some learning, some new experience, something good came out of it. And what has come out of this for me is a fundamental shift in how I look at every single thing. I could talk about it for days. I've already talked about it for long enough. I would love to, in some way, um, collate some of this stuff and make it more useful to other people. I mean, it's all out there already. There's nothing new in what I'm saying. It might just be that collated in a different way and presented in a different way, um, it, it would help some more people. And I want to underline that I'd never preach this stuff. I'm not asking you to believe me. I would never ask anyone to believe me. And I would never suggest that it is, is necessarily going to work for you if you're struggling with similar kind of problems. You know, we're all different, different things work. So please don't think I'm trying to be preachy about it. I'm just trying to give you my own experience. But my experience is the combination of learning kind of the fundamentals of, I mean, I don't even know where toll as the power of now comes from. I mean, it's, it sounds kind of Buddhist in many respects, but as he talks about in the in the book you know it's kind of wider than than a single sort of faith or religion it's not it's not religion based um combining that with the courage to be disliked the adlerian psychology bit i would say that my mental health in the space of two years is fundamentally better um you know i've had I have lots of open conversations with friends and certainly with Dan and Catherine about it and um you know they would agree Catherine says that that I'm much more balanced than, than I was before. The vast majority of nasty comments just roll off me now because what I can see is that they're coming from the same place, uh, get ready for some terms here, of mind identification and unconscious behaviour that was the same thing that I was uh, in in my downtime, you know. Um, they're coming from the same place. The only time they bother me now is when I'm in that place, when I'm kind of unconsciously identified with all the negativity in my mind. Uh, and that's when they bother me. And, and the useful part of this, the useful learning here, is that if I start to feel like that, this a little alarm bell goes on that says, hang on a minute, mate. Stand over there, look back at yourself. Look at how you're feeling. Don't judge it. Just stand over there, look back at it. This is why you are feeling that way, because you're becoming unconsciously identified with your mind. You're not in this moment right now, conscious and present. I appreciate that that's a bit of terminology and it sounds a bit kind of academic and preachy. Please, please don't accept it as preachy. They're just, they are the correct terms. So it, it makes sense. But being in that mind identified state, you're in psychological time. You are either in the future or you're in the past. None of which are any good to you whatsoever. The only moment that matters is right now. So if you're conscious and present, you're in this moment and all of the worry uh, and hope for the future aren't kind of clouding your judgment right now and all the regret and nostalgia about the past aren't clouding your judgment right now. And by staying in that psychological time, that's when those behaviours that I was talking about at the beginning of this, what has now become a monologue, <laughs> start to manifest. Those what I would define as poor decisions about the actions that you're taking, which lead to feeling bad because you become identified with all your failures, all the things you don't like, your demons start talking to you and it's just bullshit. Never has the term, watch your mind, been so important. The more you do it, and the more you keep doing it, the more you realise that it is a really fantastic state of mind. Now, you might be minded to say, well, isn't it just like being drugged or drunk, you know, in this sort of blissful state of ignorance about what's actually happening? I would say it's the opposite of that. And I'll use an analogy. Take your arm, right? Your arm's a really useful tool. It's really good for picking stuff up and putting stuff down. It's really good for playing the guitar with a hand on the end of it. Um, you know, it's a really useful thing that you have to use. It's a tool. Your mind is exactly the same thing. It's a tool that you can use. So if your mind is bogged down with all this stuff, right? Future stuff, past stuff, worry, regret, all this, all this stuff that's just in your brain clouding your judgment. It's the equivalent of trying to carry a heavy bag in your useful tool arm. 
So you can't play the guitar if you're carrying a heavy bag. You can't do all these things. Okay, this analogy is already getting worn out. You can see what needs to come next. Put the bag down. Just put it down. That takes some doing, takes some thinking, <laughs> might take some therapy. Might just take a realisation one day where you wake up and say, I'm not going to be stressed anymore. I'm putting this bag down. But genuinely, I'm not trying to escape anything. I'm not chasing some eternal happiness. I just want to be free in my brain to feel everything that is appropriate to feel at that moment, whether that's happiness, sadness, or any other kind of emotion. I'm not just clouded with all this stuff. And I can hand on heart say it's the freest and clearest. I don't too much like using the word happy because it's, you know, it's emotional along with all the others, but the f I am at peace. My brain, when I'm in this place, I'm at peace. Now, I'm not saying I, can, I, I achieve it all the time. And actually, in the last month, certainly post-Christmas, there have definitely been a, uh, a dark day or two. But having done all this learning and reading and practice, getting out of that dark day is so much easier than it was before. I'm going to continue my studies. I'm going to continue being focused on this stuff. And I don't say it lightly when I think it will probably take the rest of my life but for whatever it's worth i feel like it is a fundamentally better way to be for me anyway okay number three i uh, finished my ep and work on my recorded uh, guitar tones at home uh, this is a source of deep shame um some of you might remember i started this ep man i hate to think it was last time mick and i were at the Tom Ann uh, Gear University. And it was so inspiring being around these amazing creative people. And I thought, that's it, you know, I'm, I'm, I really want to do this. Uh, my band had just finished and I thought, okay, I'm going to write some songs and just, you know, put it out there. And it has taken forever. Now, last year I did work on the EP. Um, Everything bar one track is recorded. I've just got some guitars to finish on that. And then hopefully at some point soon, I'm going to get to go and see Paul Stacey. We're going to talk about mixing um, and those uh, concepts to get the most out of your mixes. Um, but one thing I did find with COVID, so we were directed to work from home where possible. And I can work from home, no problem. What I did find with working from home um, is that my moments of creative inspiration were few and far between. Uh, it, you know, those moments when they hit you, um, they fill you with energy and, and focus. And I, I, yeah, I was lacking that. I think the whole, you know, saga of 2020 just made those moments few and far between for me. Um, but it's nearly there. It's nearly there. Uh, it just, you know, the, the last track and some mixing, and then it shall be done. Learn the old Joanna, you say? Um, not really. I had great hopes of learning the piano. Uh, the, the old video will tell the story, but actually this is connected with the depression thing because one of the things that was helping me, um, in addition to all the mind stuff, was exercise. And uh, I was doing a bit of running, my knees are paying the price of that, so I don't do too much running. Um, and I was trying to learn the piano, partly as, as a different headspace, um, and also to try and help me on guitar a bit, you know, like break the patterns of guitar by learning a different instrument. The utterly awesome human being, Jack Duxbury, phoned me one day. This was like last year before COVID. I don't know, November or December, maybe. Uh, 2019. And said, oh, I'm passing, uh, do you want a piano lesson? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so Jack dropped in and gave me the most unbelievable piano lesson, which just gave me the tools um, to think differently about learning the piano. Smug ending. Ha, ha, ha.
unfortunately, I haven't kept it up. Um, I haven't practiced. Uh, I haven't carried on with that. And that just that just is what it is. I'm not going to judge it. I'm not going to feel bad about it. It just is what it is. And we move on. So bouncing back with a positive note with number four, uh, my goal was to acquire an old tally. And here she is, my 1965 Fender Telecaster. So some of you may remember, uh, a few years ago, we had a gentleman by the name of Pete Lewis from Lewis Guitar Works got in contact with us and said, I've got some old Fenders if you guys want to come down and check them out. So we went down and it was, oh, it was just the best day. And he had these beautiful uh, old Fenders and this was one of those. And I remember picking it up the first time and just, just being blown away with it. <laughs> Wait, but that's the sound. So a couple of things about this guitar. Um, it, the body is a refin. Okay, so that is um, uh, not original finish and the neck has been uh, sprayed over. A long time ago, um, but it is um, not the original finish on the neck. And the pickups in this were not original either. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a mint 65 by any stretch of the imagination, but it was, you know, it had the wood, it had the important thing. Um, and I just fell in love with it. And I guess it was this guitar that was always hanging around the back of my mind. Um, so when we did uh, our Money No Object Challenge, I got in touch with Pete and said, oh, would it be okay to um, borrow that guitar? And he said, yeah, no problem. So I, came, I went down and got the guitar and I knew at that point that um, I just, I had to find a way because I just couldn't let this guitar go. Yes, so now I'm a very happy uh, owner of a 1965 Fender Telecaster. Resolve the strap problem. Yeah, okay, so to, well, throughout 2019 probably, I'd started to look at Blue, um, my main guitar, and decided it wasn't really working for a few reasons, and uh, regular viewers will know that Dan and I had both Blue and Red refretted. That really did make a massive difference, um, and I started to connect with the guitar again, but I'd started to get really itchy about whether it could stand up to a proper old guitar and whether my sort of motley collection of newer strats really were in that league or could indeed be anywhere near that league of a proper vintage 60s strat. I've been very privileged to play them all over the years. I mean, not every strat, but certainly <laughs> examples of most strats um, and lots of them. 30 years actually playing Strats. Got my first Strat, I think, when I was... Well, it's more than 30 years now, I think, when I was 14. And then, of course, during my job uh, at Guitarist Magazine and the other guitar magazines that I worked on through the years and doing other work in the guitar industry, um, you know, you get to play a lot of guitars. Vintage ones, best of the custom shop, all the ones in between, cost-effective ones, you know. But, unfortunately, I still think nothing really comes close to a really lovely vintage strap. That said, uh, some of the improvements that I've made to Blue, um, changing out the bridge, uh, pickups, Ron Ellis pickups, I mean, even as simple as the refret and new nut, you know, have certainly made it a guitar that I am bonded with in a different kind of way. You know, I'll, I'll never not be bonded with that guitar. Now, a few people have helpfully suggested, well, why don't you just sell everything and buy an old strap? I did think about that. Um, there's a couple of reasons why that's not practical. One is Dan and I need to keep a selection of guitars here at TPS, you know, for the show. Secondly, 
while I might not love every single guitar equally and want to play it all the time, they do have sentimental value and they do have meaning in how they were come by the people that were involved in those acquisitions you know memories of times and places so i don't want to be without some of those some of those guitars um i've considered what have i considered selling my motorbike um to raise some cash taking a bank loan you know all of those things that you could do to buy a guitar um i think it'll probably happen at some point um but i don't know i just i'm i'm definitely in this m- mood of being conscious and present and my my gut is telling me that now is not the right time not least because the price of vintage fenders is insane you know what are you looking at so it's uh january 2021 like a non-refin fairly battered about 63 18 grand 15 to eighteen thousand pounds i mean that's that's bonkers money they that's as, as high as i can remember them being Anyway, I haven't really felt motivated to do any of those things. Certainly a year with absolutely no gigs and no hope of any gigs. Um, Pretty low creative energy as well. I mean, I don't want this to be a downer. It's just reality. It's the way it is. And I should try not to judge it. It just is as it is, right? Um, But to to drop all that money on on something like that at the moment where I don't really have a creative outlet for it, um, especially when for me uh, it would be, you know, quite a problematic purchase it's not the kind of thing that you know i'm not a city trader where i can just dip into my bonus this month and uh, buy a nice old guitar with due respect to all those people who are able to do that i'm not in that i'm not in that game so for me it is just like a really serious decision all that said i mean it's got to happen someday because mainly because every time i pick up any of my strats i my brain says i wish this was an old one um, and at this point i must say a massive thank you to simon green who's lent me the 61 Um, which has just been a great privilege to be around and learn more about a nice example of such a beautiful old thing. So yes, the Strat journey continues uh, and a bit like an improvement in mental health, I don't think it will ever end. Okay, number five, start gigging again. Right, this really needs no no explanation. Um, I had been playing in a band called Tin Spirits for 10 years and, and I loved that band. We didn't gig often. I had been doing cover gigs for a long, long time, and I'd stopped those like a year beforehand. And I got to the point, it's like, yeah, let's start doing some gigs. And Mick and I um, got the um, TPS band together, and we had uh, Paddy on bass and uh, Dougie on drums, and it was so much fun. We thought, right, let's go and do some gigs. And we organized a tour with Andy Timmons. And we're going to fly Andy over. And we had, I think, five dates we we're going to do, um, including the Cavern Club in Liverpool. And um, yeah, some, some dates in the UK. And I was so looking forward to that sort of kicking off a year of some really great gigs. Of course, um, COVID hits and everything's locked down. So yeah, that is one thing that I am so looking forward to. Um, you know, coming into summer, the gig's going to be back. Um, yeah, so from the summer onwards, hopefully we can start, you know, booking some gigs and dust the cobwebs off and get out there again. But yeah, definitely, definitely, uh, you know, in the top five things I'm looking forward to most about getting things back on track. So Dan was going to do more gigs in 2020. I didn't dare suggest that, uh, not because I had a crystal ball about COVID, but because I just know how previous years have gone. Mine was start enjoying the guitar a bit more again. And I've definitely had glimpses of it. You know, there have been moments in the year uh, where I am just reminded that, you know, aside from family, wife and all that stuff, put, put, put human interaction outside of it. It's literally the best thing ever. Guitar is just the best thing ever that said uh for lots of the reasons discussed in this video and yeah there's been a bit of philosophy in this and a lot of talking but you know it's valuable and i kind of want to get it said i have been in a period of very serious reflection with the guitar through this year and it's not um the first time it's happened and it probably won't be the last and the good thing about that is that you kind of you start to notice a pattern and you stop worrying about it so much and you just let it be what it is when it happens but yeah you know there have been times during 2020 where i've gone i i just wonder if i'm done with guitar which of course is completely ridiculous 
it's a function of what we do. Any musician, any artist, anyone who does anything creative uh, will relate, you know, crippling self-doubt and all of that. Um, yeah, it, it's a state of mind that I think a lot of artists and creatives get into. Everyone gets into. And it's an interesting cul-de-sac, right? Because not playing the guitar for me is a very dangerous place to be. Not having that outlet to be creative in that way is anyone who's felt it will know but it is almost impossible to describe to someone who hasn't felt it that feeling that you get when you're connecting. Um, and that connection might happen when you have a moment, you know, just practicing or playing at home or whatever. I, I would say that the moment is probably more powerful when there is an audience in the context of a performance or in, indeed any interaction with other human beings. So it might be in the practice room. But those moments are moments of pure flow, of pure clarity and of the most unbelievable freedom. So being without that is really tough. This all relates to what I was saying earlier about mental health. So there's no, you know, when you're in that flow and when you're in that moment, there's no past, there's no future. You're not even worried about what you're going to play next because you're flowing and, and that's the, the point. And it's this weird thing where this moment has this kind of infinite, this sense of infinite to it because that's all there is, this moment. And at the, at the risk of sort of more terms or more hippie talk or whatever you want to call it, that's the moment we're all seeking. That is the moment of presence and consciousness. So enjoy the guitar more. Well, that's what, that's what I'm looking for. That's what I've been looking for. And no matter what you do, whether you're riding your motorbike at 100 miles an hour or you're on the north face of the Eiger or whatever it is that you do to access that moment, it's the best thing you'll ever experience because it's all you have. And of course, the opposite side of that is when you're not playing and when you don't have that. And don't get me wrong, you don't have to be accessing it 24 hours a day, but if you can access it once a week at your, at your gig or your rehearsal room, or even if you only access it once every three months because all the rest of it is kind of psychological time of going, oh, my tone sucks, or why, why can't the bass player play in tune? You know, <laughs> all of that stuff. But that's what that is. When you're not in that moment, my life anyway becomes psychological time. It becomes past and future and all these worries and all this bullshit. I'll say it again about why you're not doing what you should be doing. So even saying something is ridiculous, I'm going to enjoy the guitar more, is just crazy. Because what that is, is a future projection uh, and it's rejecting this current moment that you have. It's saying, it'll be better in the future. It's no good to you. It's, it's just as useless as making a New Year's resolution. To which I will add that, yeah, I spent a lot of 2020 really not enjoying the guitar, unfortunately. Again, I don't want to bring everyone down. I think other people will have had a similar experience because I was so focused on wanting to enjoy it. What a flipping cul-de-sac that is. Now, I am in danger of disappearing up my own butthole at this point with, uh, you know, all this talk of psychology and philosophy and terminology and, the, and, you know, consciousness and presence and the power of now and all of that. And if you are feeling that way... I'm right with you because maybe Frank Zappa realised the profundity of what he said. Because it's the one thing that I need to do which will just make all this crap go away. And it might work for you too. Just shut up and play your guitar. So that's it from me. I would wish everyone uh, all the best and the hope for a better 2021. But um, hopefully the tenor of all of this stuff today would mean there's not much point in doing that. What I wish everyone is a better present and conscious moment right now, this moment. So there was our New Year's resolutions for 2020. Um, got a couple of hits, got a couple of misses. Um, yeah. Do resolutions help? What do you think, Mick? <laughs> Yes, mate, indeed. Um, at the time of recording your parts, you haven't heard everything I've just said. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how much use resolutions are, to be honest. Firm and solid plans that you carry out, absolutely. That's your resolution. Go for it and congratulations to you. But, you know, I don't know. I kind of want to lose a bit of weight. I want to, you know, it's all fooey. Do or do not, as Yoda said, uh, don't make resolutions about it. 
Okay, thank you so much for watching. A massive thank you to our patrons on Patreon. Thanks to all our preferred retailers. You can see all the information if you click the description down. Please visit the TPS store to buy merch and all that kind of stuff, such as this Reverb t-shirt here. Ooh, that's nice. Okay, thank you so much for watching. Um, we will catch you on Monday for the live VCQ, which happens right here at 5 p.m. GMT. Uh, till then, have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.